Let's go to God in prayer. Great, loving God, thank you that although you are God of this universe, you are God who created us and all that we see, you are also God who comes close, who comes as close as a table, who comes close as in our own hearts, who comes close to us. And though we don't always understand you, Lord God, because you are, your thoughts are much greater than our thoughts. Your wisdom is far beyond what sometimes we can comprehend. You brought yourself close in your son, Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for Jesus this morning. I thank you that he tried to make things as clear as he could using the words that he had at his disposal, using the experiences that we can somehow relate to. He tried to help us and tries today to help us to understand you. For you are our Father and we are your children. And Lord, there's a lot of learning to do as a child. And Lord, whatever age we may be among us this morning, we know we still have some learning to do. How to be, how to live in a way that expresses your love and your grace and your mercy to those we meet. And how to let them know about you. So Lord, we need more help. We need you as we uh, stumble along in this life. And as we seek to understand how you meet us at this table in your son, Jesus, we need to know more. And then we need to, to take what we've learned and let it be what we know in our heart. To know that beyond anything we've learned. To know for sure that you are ours and we are yours. For that is what we need most of all. And Lord God, today we, we have folks that are, are, have hurts. Lord, and some are hurts that we maybe don't know all about them. We just know there's some hurting going on. And we know that you, through Jesus, offered remedies. You offered a remedy in your son Jesus to our hurts. So Lord, today we lift up people who we know who we want to be receive that, that remedy. And Lord, I thank you. That's how we begin. We say thank you, for we know that you are with Wayne Doyle Jr., Lord, in his struggles to know what's going on in the hospital and with his parents. We know that you're with Jane in the situation she's in, Lord. We thank you that you're with K Kenneth, as he uh, meets the challenges in his life. We thank you for being with Norma and the family that surrounds her. We thank you for being with Janet as she's in the rehab and Bill is there with her, helping her as best he can. We thank you for being with Linda as she struggles with a sore foot right now and other issues. We thank you for being with Leonard and the challenges that he faces. We thank you for being with Kenda and with Jim and the challenges they face. We thank you, Lord, you are with Samantha. Lord, we thank you that you are with Grace and she's, her challenges, she greets every day, Lord, that you thank you for helping her to manage to, to in spite of them, to come and be here, to go and to do the things that she wants to do and needs to do in life. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, for grace. And Lord, that you have not left her. You have not forsaken her. And we bless you for that. We thank you for being with Amelia, who could come down this morning for the children's time and be in school and not have to be at doctors every week anymore. We bless you for that, Lord. We thank you for that wonderful blessing. 
Lord, we lift up those that are all across our United States that are is having issues with flooding, Lord, but also people with fires. And Lord, those that are struggling in other ways, what other things that are happening in their lives. And Lord, we also lift up as we, as we think about our nation, we think about how we connect with other nations, Lord God, and, and the papers are full of the things that of the problems that are faced by people all over our world. So, Lord, we know it's not just this nation, but you love our whole world. So we lift them to you. And we believe that you, O oh Lord, are, are not just watching, but you are interacting with people the world over, that they would know you, and in knowing you, they would find grace for their lives and the situations they are in. Lord God, we, there may be people that, um, people in our pews today, the people that they know that have needs. So Lord, if there's now are spoken or unspoken, Lord, we lift those to you. We bless you, Lord Jesus, for being present and for your Holy Spirit that speaks to us and to those we love and those that you love, Lord God. In your name we pray it. Amen. We join together in our hymn of meditation. In my life, Lord, be glorified. First scripture today is going to be Exodus 12, 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel, that on the tenth of this month, they are to two take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. And this is how you shall eat it. Your, learn, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all of the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, this is your word this morning, and not mine. And Lord, though I am fallible, let the words that I say be your words. Let it be what you 
would have us know this day. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. The other scripture lesson for this morning is from Matthew. Matthew 26, verses 14 through 30. Hear the word of the Lord. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house and my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him, one to, from after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. Then the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who had betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. And he replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the, my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Each week in this sermon series on hospitality, there's been a meal. The first week, it was the meal that Abraham and Sarah fixed for the three visitors. The last week, it was the meal that Simon the Pharisee had at his house. And today, it's the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples called the Last Supper. It's the meal we remember and we share around the table here. But we call it the Lord's Supper or Communion or Eucharist, depending on your tradition. Any way you look at hospitality, it seems to include a table. In the first century Palestine, Palestine where uh, Jesus was at the time this was written, or at the time when it happened, I should say, the table was central to the family. Often there was one large meal at the end of the day. They were seated on the ground around a low table. There was a shared loaf of bread and a shared bowl of meat sauce. No silverware in sight. You didn't have to know how to use your knife or a fork. You just tore off the bread, you put it in the meat sauce, and you took it and put it in your mouth. That was your spoon, your fork, and your knife right there. The table was as much for them, not just a t What did I write? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't read my own writing. Sorry. The table was... As much for them a table as it was for their families. It was, a, it, was, it was like the place for the family. It was the place of mutual trust. If you sat at table with someone, that meant you shared a relationship. And it was a protected relationship. You belonged to them and they belonged to you. This meal and your companions revealed who you were. So whoever you sat with is how people looked at you. It had a, there was a lot going on at, at the table, more than meets the eye. In Jesus' day, there were words that they used that meant different things. You could say house, like somebody where they lived, but it also meant your lineage, your ancestry was your house. You could say the word bed, and that might be the thing you sleep in, but also it talked about the relationship you had and your most intimate relationship. And then there was the word table. Well, that's the table you have in your living room or your, or your kitchen, but it also meant your family and friends. All of those you trusted and all of those you depended on, that was the word table. So to be invited as a guest at a person's house meant you were under their protection. 
As long as you were with that family, they had to protect you. They were honor-bound to protect you, even at the cost of their lives. The table is found all the way through Scripture. If you start looking through Scripture, where the table is, and one of the most important places, what Adam read for us this morning, was the centerpiece of Jewish history, the Passover meal that was, about the, that was in, of course, the book of Exodus, and it happened during the Exodus as the exodus was beginning. When Pharaoh refused to allow the Jews to leave Egypt, God says, okay, Moses and Israelites, start planning your feast. It's going to happen in a few days. The feast that is going to be as its centerpiece, the lamb that was slain. You know, they, the Jews didn't drink, there was no blood in the animals the Jews consumed. For a kosher lamb, it had to have all the blood drained out of it. So that's what they did. They took the lamb and they killed the lamb and then they took that blood and drained it out. And you know, they said, they put it on the doors, all over the doorposts and door frames of the house. And then they roasted that lamb and they, did, and they shared it. But if you had a good sized lamb, you needed to go find somebody else to eat with you because all that lamb had to be consumed that night. There would be no leftovers in the refrigerator, because there was no refrigerator. There was no leftovers at Passover. And you weren't to have the leavened bread that had nice puffy bread. You had to have unleavened bread, because you could bake it and cook it quickly, because you were in a hurry. And if you think about it, they started at twilight, and that's when they um, killed the lambs. Then they had to roast the lamb, and then they had to eat the lamb. Basically, Passover took all night long. And they were in their house together celebrating the Passover, if you can call that. It was a celebration, but it was also a place where they were protected. Remember the blood on the doorpost? It was a protected place. God was the host that night. God invited them to this meal, and God said, I'll give you my protection while you eat the Passover meal. Meanwhile, Egypt was being judged, and all the firstborn were being taken. They were being killed, but not the Israelites. They were safe from harm. Later in the wilderness, God would institute another table, and this is the one that was in the tabernacle, the big tent, and the, al the table was called the altar, and that's where they brought their sacrifices. Now, some of those sacrifices, the sin and the guilt offerings, were completely consecrated to God, but others called the fellowship and the shalem, which is the peace offerings, the worshiper and his family, because it was always the man, you know, in those days, the man and his family would come along with the priests and they would eat part of that fellowship or shalem offering at the table. Part of it would be set to be consecrated and part of it they, they would eat. Their understanding was that when they ate from the altar, it was they were dining at God's table. And through the shalem offering, they celebrated their shalom or their peace with God and each other. This was considered a true covenant communion. Hmm, kind of like a table we're going to share today. In our New Testament scripture for today, we saw the Passover being celebrated by Jesus and his disciples, his family, if you will. But at the table... Everything's not very peaceful, is it? I mean, Jesus begins the table together by telling his closest friends that one of you is going to betray me. I mean, that was kind of a not a great conversation starter at the table. But that's how he began. And as I thought about that, you know, Jesus could have acted like everything was going to be fine, even though he knew everything wasn't going to be fine. But that wasn't who Jesus was. And that isn't who Jesus is today. There is no pretending or smoothing over the troubles that were happening in that small group. Jesus knows the reality of our hearts, whether we like it or not. And from what I can see of Jesus' hospitality at that table, hospitality includes honesty. And Jesus was trying to get some honesty around that table. As we approach this table today, to enjoy the hospitality of this table, Jesus invites us to be honest and to admit our own betrayals 
in whatever shape they come. As I thought about Judas, I wondered what motivated him to betray Jesus. What, what was it in him that made him, want, you know, do what, he, you know, to go to the, to the religious officials? Was it the money? He did get some money out of it. Or maybe it was a sense of power because he went to these very powerful religious figures and said, I have the power to turn Jesus over to you. Or maybe it was he just was trying to test Jesus. That's one thought on that is he wanted to see if Jesus was really God and what he would do in that situation. Whatever the reasons, we probably would understand that it is the self, something about Judas, his own self, that was at the core of his betrayal. I think if we are in the place of betraying someone, we're doing it for a selfish reason. Now, we may never know Judas' reasons, but we do know about our own hearts. We do kind of, I hope we know a little bit about ourselves, and that if we find ourselves betraying someone, it's going to affect that relationship. But what Jesus is telling us, it affects our relationship with him too. And, and the things we do may not be so drastic. I mean, they're just little things, little betrayals, like talking about others in ways that we wouldn't really talk to them, but we talk to others about them that way. Or maybe blaming others instead of taking my own responsibility, I'd just as soon push that blame off on somebody else. Or maybe letting money motivate our actions towards others instead of, instead of the need that's there. Those are just a few I thought of. But maybe it isn't our betrayal that's the problem. Maybe it's somebody betrayed us. Maybe we've had felt betrayal from other people in our lives. Um, I know that when I was going through divorce, I felt betrayed. I, that was exactly how I felt. That was the emotion. And I felt betrayed because of the promises that had been made in that wedding ceremony. And I was mad. And I didn't want to get over my anger. You know, I thought it was a good, <laughs> righteous anger there. But after a while, I realized that it was in the way of relationships. I could hold on to that feeling, whatever I felt of being betrayed. But it, but it was getting in the way. Because when we come back down to Jesus, Jesus knows he knew my heart. He knows our hearts. He knows our selfish motivations better than we do. And he feels betrayed by our betrayals and by your and my inability to forgive. He knows our every weakness, and yet he still offers to us his hospitality, which includes his peace and his protection in this meal, just as he offered it to Judas and all the rest of of his disciples. Well, there is good news today. There is good news when we come to this table because Jesus is indeed the host. It certainly isn't me. And we sit at this table with him. And when we come together as the family, like we're going to do in just a few minutes, Jesus is our forever Passover lamb. He doesn't have to go through that again. He is that forever. And because of that, he can give us life to the places that need life in us. That's why we come and say confession like we did, why we had time to, to offer up to God anything that was in the way. Because when we confess the stuff that isn't the best part of us, whatever it is, to each other and to Jesus, then Jesus, through his body and blood, can give us life, can give us forgiveness, can give us protection and the peace that is in the kingdom of God. This is really the table that we celebrate in the kingdom of God. Now and when, when it's finally a glorious feast that is when everyone's together. So as, we, as often as we want to come to this table, Jesus says, I'll offer you myself. That we, each of us, might become more and more like him, like I told the children. And as we become more like him, he continues to, to offer us to belong to him. The more we come to this table, 
the more we belong to him. We can let go of our self-centeredness and Jesus can become our center, allowing us to share his hospitality with others. For in this meal that we share with him and we share with each other, we reveal who and whose we are. Let's pray. Jesus, we don't really like hearing about betrayal. We don't really like hearing about the hard things in life that we deal with, whether it's us betraying others or whether others have betrayed us. But I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you don't sugarcoat things and you don't push them under the carpet, but you bring them out in front of us so that we can address them and then we can turn to you and tell you what we've done or what we haven't done. And Lord, I thank you that you, again, just like you did with your disciples, you call us back to the table. You want to spend time with us because you know when you become the center of who we are, then we are able to let go of some of the things that get in our way and get in the way of our relationship with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your love and your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. As you go out this week, you take God's manna with you. You take the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. So I invite you to share that hospitality as honestly as you can. In the name of the Father, his beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.